and welcome to Pacific Mammal Research's Marine Mammal Highlight Series. We are a research and education nonprofit studying marine mammals in the Salish Sea off Washington State. In this series, you will learn about different marine mammals as we discuss the interesting facts about each species and debate which one we think is the best. Of course, we think all marine mammals are awesome. This is just our way to geek out, share some information, and have some fun. We hope you enjoy this series, and if you want to hear about a particular marine mammal, let us know in the comments. And without further ado, welcome to the next Pac-Man podcast. This is another episode of the Marine Mammal Highlights, and this week we're talking more about um, how marine mammals help other animals. Uh, and I'll be talking a little bit about how they can help us. Um, so it's going to be a fun one. We have three, three, three topics this week. Um, I'm Cindy, and I'm going to be talking about something that everybody knows, most likely, or has heard about, uh, the kelp and the urchins and the otter relationship. And, and I'm Kat. Um, I'm going to be talking about commensalism. We will define that later. Big word. And I am Trevor, and I'm going to be talking about the dolphin and tuna relationship in the open water. Which might be a little bit sad part of the episode, <laughs> but we'll get to that. <laughs> so I'm going to start off, because uh, this is the one that, if you've had a high school biology class or your environmental science or ecology class, you've probably heard about this relationship. Um, Trevor, you were saying that it's taught in your fisheries biology. They beat it to death in every class. <laughs> Because it, it, it's a really good example of what it's trying to show. So that's why they do it. It's the same um, thing in Australia, too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's universal, kind of. Um, so what we're talking about is the fact that you have uh, these sea otters, which are su super cute and furry and adorable. Um, <laughs> but they're also really super duper important to the ecosystem and the environment. So these guys are what we call a keystone species. And a keystone, the reason why it's called a keystone species is because when you build like a bridge or an arch, um, there's this like wedge-shaped stone that they put in the middle and that basically holds the arch up. So that's the keystone, right? The one that's in the middle. What happens if you take that keystone out of the arch? Collapse. And that's what happens to the ecosystem when these particular species are removed. Uh, and so again, all species are important in the ecosystem. They all have their important parts to it. But these ones tend to have um, a stronger effect on the ecological health of an area. Um, so these, so it's the sea otters is a good example of this. So what happens is you have sea otters, and they love to eat sea urchins, and sea urchins love to eat kelp. Now, the crazy thing about sea urchins I always find is that they don't actually eat the whole kelp. <laughs> They're just eating the little holdfast, which is like the anchor that anchors the kelp to the bottom. And then the kelp just dies and flows away. Um, so I think it's kind of it's kind of rude of them. They're not really eating that much of it, <laughs> just like biting it off. But anyway, they that's how they get their nutrition. Okay, fine. Um, but so they are, but the urchins are voracious eaters. They will just decimate a a kelp forest. Um, so that's bad for the kelp forest. Uh, the otters are also voracious eaters. Um, and we talked about sea otters in one of our other episodes. Check that out. Um, but they have to eat up to a quarter of their body weight per day. So it's like 11, up to 11 kilograms a day. Which is a so, lot of food. Yeah, so they can eat a lot of urchins. <laughs> and they eat other things as well. Um, but, and it didn't, something just came up on our, on Facebook and, and some other news stories that a, a sea otter brought up a, what, what kind of shark was it? The horn shark. Horn and shark. It, there's like a whole body wrapped around it. Yeah, that was so gnarly. I know the sea otter, and he's just like holding this horn shark, like, oh, hello. I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> was he gonna eat it? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's a big meal. Yeah, seriously. I was like, well, maybe he was getting ready for Thanksgiving. That's what he was doing. Yeah. Okay. There you go. There you go. Um, so anyway, they can eat a lot of urchins, and so what they found um, when they started looking, uh, because remember that sea otters were killed for their pelts, their their fur. They had the a million, up to a million square, a million hairs per square inch, so super soft. So in areas where those, where the sea otters were killed, 
you would see these the kelp forests are gone and when you you know, dive down underneath you see just these barren lands they call them urchin barrens because they're just covered in urchins with no kelp so great for the urchins well until they eat all the food and then they don't have anything but <laughs> right that's that um but what else depends on the kelp forest everything that uses protection Everything, right? <laughs> Mollusks, crustaceans, other marine mammals. Have you seen pictures of sea lions, especially like California sea lions, playing and diving through the kelp? So without that kelp forest, it's a whole basic ecosystem that's basically gone. Um, so that's why the sea urchins are such a important species. Now, the other reason why that's important is because it's what we um, call a trophic cascade. So we used to look at the ecosystems as from the bottom up. Right, Every, the most important stuff is the bottom things because that's what feeds everybody else on top. But what this showed, and this was one of the first ones that kind of showed this, and I think that's why it's such a, a topic that's used, um, is that it's a that we see that there's top-down control. So you have this cascade, and um, so you start with the sea otters, you take them out, and it cascades down, right? It trickles down to just dis disrupt everything below it. So it's that the definition of a trophic cascade is the effect of apex predators on the lower trophic levels through top-down forcing. So it was this first one that we saw that did that. Um, the other probably most common one you'll hear uh, talking about these trophic cascade cascades is the um, is it's in Yellowstone, right? The um, mm -hmm. the elk oh, yeah. and the wolves and yep. the uh, forests and the trees. Um, so same kind of thing. You have wolves. You remove the wolves. Elk explode and they destroy all the trees and habitats for a lot of other organisms. So um, basically, it, we, they reintroduce sea otters in many places and where they've reintroduced them, the kelp forests are doing pretty well, if not great. Um, and where they're still not there, they're not and you have these urchin barrens. So that uh, by itself, they're super important. <coughs> Excuse me, and helping a lot of other animals, including other marine mammals. But the way that they're more connected to us, which, which I kind of hadn't put together right away um, until I read about it, uh, is back to, we talked about last week, the carbon, right? the carbon sequestering, carbon storage. So kelp are very big. <laughs> they can be like, it's up to 100 feet, I think, mm -hmm. every blade can be. Yep. So very large, high biomass. I mean, if you've ever seen a kelp forest, you, and divers can get um, tangled in them and um, they, because they're so just flowing and everywhere. So a lot of biomass, they're extremely productive. So they do a lot of photosynthesis. Photosynthesis means you're taking carbon dioxide. So when you're taking into carbon dioxide, you're taking it out of the atmosphere. So it's not going up and being that layer of greenhouse gas that's uh, helping to cause climate change. Um, so it's a really good carbon sequester. So if you remove that forest, it's a huge chunk of carbon that is now not that is now being kept out in the atmosphere. Right. So there was a study in 2012 that showed this is, these are large numbers. Uh, in a 5.1 times 10 to the 10th square meter area, so it's pretty pretty big. Good luck making sense of that in your mind. Right. About what yeah, that actually I, means. <laughs> I don't have a good relationship as right. to what that huge. is, but it's huge. pretty big, right? <laughs> um, but in the grand scheme of things, not in the in grand scheme of the ocean, right? So in that area, the effect of sea otter predation, so them eating the urchins and allowing the kelp to survive, um, would mean a living kelp biomass of um, four, uh, it would allow that bio, the kelp to sequester 4.4 .4 to 8.7 teragrams or 1 trillion grams <laughs> of carbon storage. And a gram is the is the weight of a, a dollar bill, right? So one thousand of them, it's gonna be a lot. One thousand grams are in a kilogram, correct? So that it would be what, like a billion kilograms? Uh, is that correct? That wouldn't be quite right. Would two, it? I think it might be a million because it's two zeros. I'm not sure. I'd have to do. The, I don't know. Do the math. <laughs> <laughs> Put the zeros down. There's too many Who zeros. Knows? But one a trillion lot. grams. It's a, it's a lot of that. And what's really interesting is that uh, you know the way that we're trying to reduce carbon is doing um, like carbon exchanges, right? So you put out a bunch of carbon, but I take away carbon. And so therefore you can pay other people to do that for you, like for the companies. 
So that amount of, of carbon is equal to 205 to 408 million dollars on wow. the European carbon exchange. And that was in 2012 prices. So who knows what it is now. Yeah. But okay. I just looked it up. So okay. one trillion grams is equal to one million metric tons. <laughs> That's a lot. Right? Because a million has six zeros. That's yes. correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wait. So no, it's 10 million because there is a one before the zeros. Uh, if it's 10, then, then it'll be 10 zeros. million. Yeah. There you Metric go. Tons. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's a lot. A lot. <laughs> Not the so again, as in context. But <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so, and, and so that's huge for climate change. Also, that's huge for money, right? If you could have the, you know save save that money and use it for something else instead of having to pay people to reduce carbon and you could just have the kelp forest do it kind of like we talked about last week like let the whales live and <laughs> reduce the amount of carbon in the atmosphere hey so it, it just goes to show how this biodiversity and nature is really important um so that's the story right they're really important for the ecosystem but also carbon sequestering which is a very hot topic and important and they're topic. still they're still bouncing back fairly quickly aren't they uh, so that's an interesting point. It depends on where you're looking. So some places oh, yeah. they've tried to reintroduce sea otters and it hasn't worked. Like, for example, here in the Salish Sea, they've, they've tried a couple spots in the Strait of Ponte Fuca, I believe, and they just don't take. Um, Which is but just other really places. Hmm? It's just really surprising to me. I just feel like this place is perfect for them. But I know, right? But I, again, things that we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, obviously, it's not in perfect for us. Can't you tell? Um, so in other places in Alaska, for example, they have, but recently they've been starting to see a decline in a, quite a few populations. Um, and the going theory, now not everybody agrees with this theory, um, but the going theory is that killer whales are starting to snack on the sea otters, um, which seems weird because they don't have much fat. They, they're, they have fur. Fur balls. So it's a fur ball. It's like literally, like, let's, eat, let's eat a fur ball. That sounds delicious. <laughs> um, so but if you're for, you know if you're if you're forced to find food you're going to eat whatever um and so the interesting part of that is that they what they're hypothesizing is that the orcas were used to eat the great whales and the great whales these ba larger baleen whales um and these are tr you know transient orcas basically um the that they once the great whales were hunted and numbers were reduced they moved on to another species. So they moved on to seals and sea lions. Those populations started to crash and now they moved on to otters. So okay. another example of a trophic cascade kind of thing where you take one thing out and how it ripples down. Um, again, not everybody agrees with that hypothesis, but that's kind of one of the, the big ones that's, that's out there for why those certain populations are, are declining where others are doing fine. But wherever you do have otters, you have beautiful lush kelp forests. Yep. So. That's my section. Um, I think next we're going to go to the depressing one. <laughs> so yeah. we can end on a not depressing note. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm going to switch over to the dolphins. And the initial relationship here is in the open ocean, in particular the tropics. So most of these observations are focused on Eastern Pacific tropics. Mm -hmm. They often see yellowfin tuna following dolphin pods, particularly spinner or spotted dolphins. Okay, I was just about and, to ask which ones. Yeah, particularly this test that I was at least reading about was mainly spotted and spinner. But these dolphins, what's happening is I initially thought the tuna were following for food. So basically the pods of dolphins are smart and they can find the same food resource that the tuna needs, so therefore the tuna follow them. But what they found was that's not necessarily true. Hmm. So when these, these tuna follow the dolphins, they're not eating at the same depth. They're not eating the necessarily the same food either. Uh -huh. So, so I, that just, I, way different than I thought. So what they did find was that they use each other for protection against predators. Oh, very so cool. Is it tuna. Like, like a schooling fish? I mean, like... What, so shark often is tuna. So the tuna are probably, they think, are using the dolphins as protection, as like herd protection. Oh, okay. I was like, are the dolphins using the tuna or the tuna using the dolphins? <laughs> it could be the same thing, too. The dolphins could be using the tuna as well. True, yeah. yeah I mean, if you get a, a big, bigger numbers, you're, you are less likely as an individual to get taken. That's why fish school. Right. 
But yeah, I always kind of thought it was for food too. I mean, that's a lot of times when you see those relationships and Kat will talk about that uh, a bit with the commensalism is that, you know, one of them's getting food from the other one. It's kind of the most obvious. So that's right. interesting. That's but protection is also important to not be food for somebody else. But, I mean, the same test found too, that sometimes say they're in the same zone of the mm -hmm. water. The, the tuna, they stick near the thermocline, which is where the, the, uh, water gets super cold all of a sudden yeah if you've ever been in the water and you you go down it's like warm 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 oh my god it's freezing that's a thermocline so they're warm. they need warm water so they can't get past that but sometimes that thermocline is really deep like 150 right. feet mm -hmm. so when they're feeding down there and the dolphins are just like 10 feet below the water feeding they determine like i mean yeah they're together but they're more separated and they're not really helping each other whatsoever they're eating different food and huh so now at that so point, they're just kind of in the same area. By yeah, Mexican it's not necessarily, scales? yeah, not use, using each other at all, really. So the only evidence they could prove was protection against predators. All right. Well, and that goes to sometimes, you know, we see these interactions and is it actually interaction or is it simply that they're both in the same place at the same time because of some other factor? I mean, right. either way, you know, fishermen can use it to their advantage because whatever the reason, if you see those dolphins, you might find the tuna with them. Exactly. Interesting. So with that, the issue is, that comes with this, is fishermen have always, not always, but for the last like 100 years, used dolphins to find tuna, essentially, because mm -hmm. it's been a known fact in the fishing community that tuna will be with the dolphins, typically. And before laws were implemented, the fishermen switched from baited hooks to Persane, I don't know if I Persane, say that right. Yeah. Okay. Persane. Which is essentially you circle a school of fish, and, and in this case, the dolphins, with a net until it's enclosed, and then basically bring up the net and then tighten it, <laughs> and you got your catch. I think that's why but, it's called a purse scene. It's like you're closing up the purse. Oh, well, there you go. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I may be completely wrong, but <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I think. <laughs> um. What happens though is they get a ton of dolphin bycatch in it, so they're mm -hmm. they're only going for the tuna for the catch. But you know, without laws, why do they care if they catch two or uh, dolphins too? They just throw yeah. them out. So that eventually led to the public finding out and the public outcry because nobody wants to kill dolphins. Dolphin <laughs> safe tuna. Right. So that, in hopes to change the fishing laws, they implemented. They, as in the U.S. and Australia and a few other countries, implemented a dolphin safe label for mm -hmm. tuna cans. So companies can only say they're dolphin safe if they have a certain number of dolphins they kill. Like, no, if they don't pass that number, that's legal. Right. That's <laughs> what, like I, I like you put the, yeah, the, the quote, as my son would say, the air quivers. <laughs> he didn't quite <laughs> get it. It's air quotes, but he likes to call them that. Um, but yeah, dolphin safe does not mean that no dolphins were killed. It means it was under the quota or under the right. restriction yeah that okay you can kill up to 10 okay you can kill up to 100 but not a thousand and so. that's only you know you only know that if you have an observer on board that's that was my other point too. i was gonna yeah. put in there yeah so a lot of these dolphin safe products i don't know how often they have observers it might just be a random like you know kind of like an audit <laughs> mm -hmm. but they usually have an observer on board that says that you know counts mortality and if they reach a certain max they can't label it or they can't yeah they can't sell it or whatever, whatever. Well, you, well you could sell it but you couldn't sell it to somebody who's going to label it as dolphin safe right exactly. right well and that's the point the hard the, the the issue with regulation in the first place especially in the fishing industry is that in order to regulate it you have to have somebody on the boat there's too many boats there's not enough people we don't have enough money to pay for the people to regulate it so it's it becomes very difficult to enforce that but a lot of dolphins were saved and and still are saved because yeah it's so that they were initially hundreds of thousands of dolphins killed every year yeah at least by the u.s but now that's down to a thousand a year so you know every every fishing trip might kill a dolphin or two or right. more i'm not sure what the exact criteria is for boat but they've right. they've reduced it a vast amount to the point where it's not nearly as damaging yeah, I mean, there's a certain level of, of loss that is acceptable 
maybe not for that individual, but acceptable for the population and in, in that the population won't decline, right? That's, that's really what that level's at. Um, and I know I've heard a lot of people say like, well, why don't the dolphins just jump out of the net? Because they can jump, right? They can jump out of the net. But it's like asking you to jump over a wall that you don't know what's on the other side. Like, yeah. you're not going to do that. <laughs> Right. And you also don't know how high the wall is. So you could right. be jumping and just hit the wall at the top. Like they don't necessarily know that it extends, you know, really just up to the surface. So, yeah, exactly. Another issue too is I think in the U S it's banned to actually chase the dolphins now because a lot mm -hmm. of them, the boats would do that to catch up to the tuna essentially and circle them. Oh, right. But that issue is chasing the dolphins like damages their mentality essentially. Is there oh, yeah. I mean, if you're being chased, you're going to, all the time you're gonna not do it right. and they you know they count deaths within the net as their mortality but they don't really count what's called cryptic deaths mm -hmm. so say you kill a dolphin's mom that needs its milk and needs its parental care right and that calf is just by itself and they eventually die maybe a week later but so that's not really accounted for and that's an issue too right or if you, if you yeah if you exhaust them to the point where they can't come up to breathe and but they're not in the net right you know something like that interesting yeah so it's gotten better but it's still not awesome yeah it's well and unfortunately with fisheries i mean i'm not a fisherman but it it is hard to catch just the thing that you are trying to catch in many of the ways that they that they fish yeah. so there is almost always going to be some level of bycatch it's where to where is that where do we put that level as acceptable um, for the populations of the of the species that we're looking at. Right. It's really hard to take population data too of just, you know, for example, like deep sea fish or if you do deep sea trawling. Right. How much, yeah. how much are you killing? How much is actually left? Right. Right. Yeah, we just don't have any good context for that. Yeah. I mean, the good thing is that, and, and the, like, uh, the highlight of that story is that public outcry is the reason why we have dolphin safe tuna and that dolphin deaths have been reduced because the corporations don't have any other reason to do that because it costs them money, then right. people won't buy their stuff. So people do really have power to make changes like this. And that's a great example of one. Mm -hmm. Tuna consumption's actually gone down too, oh, in general. Mm -hmm. So that's actually reduced some fishing effort too. Well, that would make sense. I wonder, is, does that have anything to do with uh, um, like pollution, like with uh, chemical loads for higher trophic fish, those ones are going to have higher levels of contaminants, possibly. Right. I didn't That's see anything about that. I think it was mainly just people access don't like to tuna anymore. <laughs> <laughs> access to other fish, and I don't want to kill dolphins. I don't want tuna. And yeah. right. That's true. I mean, some people probably just said, "I'm not, I, I'm not even going to buy any tuna at all." So that would make yeah, sense. Yeah, I actually I know quite a few people who did that, and they're like, "You look, we can't guarantee that." Like you said, we don't know if there were dolphins killed. Period. Like obviously, there's fewer right. than the threshold, but we don't, you know, we don't need this. We're not. We don't want to be responsible for that. So, right. I think Again, who knows have made that decision. You know, without an observer, who knows what happens? Exactly. Maybe they're careful with an observer on board. Right. And I'm sure there are some companies that actually do try to do the right thing and oh, yeah. try to do it not, but there are those that don't. So you just, you don't know. That's the problem. Right. And, and like you said, I mean, just unfortunately the level is just, there's, there's, it's hard to avoid bycatch period. Like even if yeah. you're doing everything right, it's just, it's really difficult to avoid. Yeah. Well, I mean, you yeah. know, we would go you know, fishing for lobsters when we were out on the, on the boat uh, in the Bahamas and you go down and dive down to catch the lobster. You have to free dive and stuff and you're not supposed to take, females that are gravid but you can't always tell and so you're not trying to but you may you think okay i think that's a male or i think that's a female that's not doesn't have eggs or whatever and you go down then you bring it up and you're like oh crap right you know so there's, it, a, lot of issues. there's a lot of issues with the catch and release laws too with mm -hmm. fish like say salmon or trout right or say you catch a trout but you just rip apart its mouth for the hook that was right. the thing in the <laughs> Right. And then, and then, and then with that, like, what do you do? Do you, do you throw it back because you're supposed to, or do you then take it to actually at least use the meat instead of just having it go right. to waste, but then you're breaking the law. So it can and be just tricky. So like, well, you know, throw it away, but it's going to die anyway. But if you say, just keep it, if you catch it, people are going to go catch it anyway. Then Right. Exactly. So it's just like, ah, it's very complicated. <laughs> this, is the, this is the end product of that conversation. <laughs> anyway, that was, a little sad, but <laughs> a little sad, but but still good. Again, the power of the people um, you do, and the power of consumption, right? So you have the power to tell the companies what you will or will not buy, 
um, and then force them to change their behavior. And so even if we can't get to zero and we, there always is going to be those issues of you make an you know, accidental kill of something that we weren't supposed to, it's still a lot better than what it was. It's right. just like what we see here with the public outcry with dams, right? right. Remove the dams for salmon and therefore orca. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's actually, be, and it's actually an issue because people are, are, are pushing it and making yeah. people think, talk and think about it. Yeah. All right. Well, moving on to uh, commensalism. Yeah, ending on a lighter topic here. <laughs> um, so again, like Cindy mentioned at the beginning, like if you have ever done um, a high school or uh, probably like first year of college, biology or ecology class, you may have already heard about commensalism. Um, but the definition of commensalism is a symbiotic relationship where one species provides protection for another that is less mobile or more vulnerable. So basically, either you get food from the situation or you get protection or you get both, typically. Ooh, typically. Um, right, exactly. And the difference between commensalism and parasitism is that this relationship doesn't damage um, the species that's effectively providing either the food or the protection. So parasitism, for example, would be you're taking those resources, but you are then damaging the species that you're taking them from in the process. Like a tapeworm. Like a tapeworm, right. <laughs> um, or in birds like the brown-headed cowbirds that will, mm. you know, basically like take over nests of a parasitized nest of other of bird species. So I have three little examples of commensalism in the marine mammal environment here. So we're going to start small and get bigger. Right. So we're going to start with lice because mm. everyone loves to talk about lice. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's start off with lice so we don't have to talk about them at the end. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm going to refer to them a little bit because they're <laughs> kind of irrelevant to the other ones too. Yeah, yeah but yeah. in a better way, I think. In a, yeah, yeah. And this isn't lice that like you, you don't need to be grossed out by these. Yeah. So they're actually they're not actually true lice, first of all. They're related to shrimp. So they're not like head lice, which I'm sure is what everybody was immediately thinking of. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm already getting itchy. Um, so they are actually a type of shrimp. Um, and they're found not just on whales, but on dolphins and porpoises as well. So they're found on all cetaceans. Um, and what's really fascinating with these guys is they actually tend to associate with one specific species. So a specific species of whale lice will preferentially be on, say, a gray whale versus on a humpback whale. So you'll find different lice uh, populations, basically different species living on different whale or dolphin or porpoise species. How do they find? Really cool. Yeah, how do they? I know, I know, and I don't know the answer <laughs> to that. But it's just, it's so cool. And I, I really had no idea and I don't know why, but there's like, there is actually quite a lot of evidence that suggests that they have preference um i wonder if they'd be picky and, like they'll float in the water and be like mm, humpback no humpback no well and i'm just no. wondering if it's like something with like maybe pheromones or like some mm -hmm. kind of scent for the speech i have no idea right. I, I couldn't find i don't think they actually really know um yeah. but apparently uh there is a particular species of whale lice that live on sperm whales and they even seem to have a preference for which gender of sperm whales so there's one lice species that lives preferentially on the males and another that lives preferentially on females, but neither of those species are found on other whale types. What? Now that's yeah. just getting really picky. Yeah. <laughs> right? Talk, I get, I get picked on for being a picky eater. Like, come on. Yeah. Like that's, 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 that's I a whole only level. eat female sperm whale. <laughs> right. Or live on female sperm whales. So yeah. actually let's move on to that. So what do they eat? when they're living on these whales. Great question. Yeah. Do, um, do, they, do they get like the food stuff that goes like particles that fly by? Kind of, yeah. Okay. So they'll typically be eating the algae and the dead skin cells that kind of would be either, obviously dead skin cells would be from the cetacean itself and the algae right. would just kind of like accumulate on top of the whale in like a thin layer. Um, and interestingly, mm -hmm. they're often found in larger numbers around either open areas, so like the blowhole or mm -hmm. around any wounds on the animal. Uh, which again, which kind of makes cells, sense, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, there's more, there's more available there. Um, and they can colonize any part of the body. So they're typically found on places, like I said, like those open areas, so like nostrils, eyes, even the genital folds. <laughs> um, and skin lesions is another one that you'll often find, which again makes sense. There's a lot more particulate matter that's on a skin lesion, like bacterial growth and that type of thing right. um, that they might be feeding on. A smorgasbord, time. really. Right? <laughs> it's like, ooh, this is this is just buffet. Wonderful. <laughs> um, 
So yeah, so that's whale lice. And one of the other things about them is that they will also live on barnacles that attach to the whales. So really? the next one I'm going to talk about is barnacles. Um, so in addition to the lice getting the food from the whales, for example, they can also get a little bit of protection. They have a, you know, they're a fairly, they can't move around a ton. Um, they're, fairly, you know, they're tiny. So once they're on the whale, they are more mobile. Um, very similar with the barnacles. So the barnacles benefit by having somewhere to live for, for starters and also plenty of access to food. They're moving around the marine environment rather than living in the intertidal zone where they have to wait for the tide to come up to provide them with food um, and then undergo long periods of drying. Yeah, so they, they don't have to worry about that whole low tide part. Right, which I mean they're adapted to deal with, but okay. equally yeah, a little bit less to. work. <laughs> yeah. Um, so one of the, the world things... World. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so one of the things, again, is, is barnacles are stationary, right? They, they literally cement onto the surface that they're found on. So how the heck do they get on a whale? <laughs> so again, we don't have a great idea, but the leading theory right now is that they start out as larvae, right? Mm -hmm. So before they become the barnacles that we know them as, is like sitting on a rock and like a little shell and everything, they are free swimming larvae. So the thought right at the moment, um, that's kind of the leading theory, is that they encounter whales that are feeding at the surface. So they right, seems they like they kind of into the plankton. Right. So they'll be kind of floating in that little, you know, mess of living creatures, kind of in the in the trophic zone, in that top zone of, of where there's light. And we don't know how or specifically when they attach to the whales. But one of the ideas is that the larvae may actually be able to somehow hook on or embed into the skin of the whale and then build the shells out around that. Oh, that makes sense if they can like hook of, in. Right. So they just, it's like, like putting a little grappling iron on there so they can stay on there while they then create and generate the cement and then build their little shell around themselves. And once the cement, once that's kind of cemented in, then they're stuck on there. They're fine. Like they, they don't have to worry about it anymore. But yeah, for that initial right. phase that's the leading hypothesis anyway. That is a great, that is a great like visual of like this, this right. little like tiny sea creature being like. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Trevor. The, the whale barnacles, they don't, they only live on whales, right? They won't live on rock or anything. Uh, I've so always I know there are some species that will preferentially live on whales. I think there might be a little bit of crossover, but I know that a lot of the barnacle species are preferentially living on whales. I've yeah. always wondered with the gray whales, for example, they get their, barnacles in the Ba area, I believe. Mm -hmm. So when they come right. up here to the Puget Sound, evidently those barnacles don't spawn or whatever and, you know, get established here in Washington. So I've just curious right. about that. Yeah, huh. no, I mean, I, I know that a lot of them are preferentially living on whales. And it's very similar to the lice that they will, a specific barnacle species will be specific to types of whale. Um, so very similar to the lice interactions. So again, it's just fascinating how all these things that you kind of don't really think about, they're obviously way more complex than we know. If they're preferentially somehow attaching, somehow preferentially finding, which again, like you said, Trevor, maybe some of it is to do with location and where that specific species of barnacle actually lives or, or you know, the, the ones that they're most likely to come in contact with, maybe they've adapted to just because they encountered them more. That's what we hook on to. It's kind but, of similar to what we talked about last week with the um, the bone boring worms and whale falls that they would right. kind of stick to species like certain species of worm would only eat the bones of certain whale species. Right. So I have this goes perfectly with this conversation. There's a, a, a quote in an article that I was reading from the naturalist John Muir. When we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. So it's true. Bam. Like, you know. It's all yeah, connected. It's fascinating. Complicated. And then, like I said, there's the different levels of this where the lice will preferentially live on specific barnacle species that preferentially live on specific whale species. <laughs> whole little ecosystem layer, on the back of a layer. whale. <laughs> Who knew? Who knew? Um, and some of these barnacle clusters can get up to a thousand pounds. So these whales are, are sometimes carrying around up to a thousand pounds worth of barnacles on their bodies. That's so heavy. I know. It's nuts. <laughs> It's nuts. Like the level of drag that that would create in the water column is crazy. Seriously. Okay. And then the last one that I want to talk about real quick is remoras. So this is probably a commensalist relationship that more people are kind of consciously aware of. They're most well known for attaching to either sharks or larger whales or dolphins. 
um, also known as suckerfish. Mm -hmm. um, and so they will typically attach to the backs or the bellies of uh, the larger whales or dolphins. Um, and they're really funny looking when you see them on the dolphins because they're actually quite large proportional to the dolphins. Yeah, we have, we, we would see them in the Bahamas and the, the spotted dolphins um, and they, you know, they could get up to a foot long and yeah. these aren't, you know, greatly yeah, long. like a foot to 30 centimeters on like a six foot animal. It's like, oh, yeah. it's kind of weird too. <laughs> well, it, it, yeah. you know, so I always think they look like somebody, there's a fish and then somebody with a sneaker just stepped on them. Like the top <laughs> of them looks like the bottom, the treads of a sneaker. Cause that dorsal yeah. thing got modified into a suction cup and it's just weird. <laughs> they are re they are really weird looking. So like Zinni said, they'll suction on, that's how they attach. Um, and from that attachment point, they'll basically like little hoovers, they'll move along the skin, eating away at dead skin cells, parasites, or leftover food fragments. So they will actually move on the animal. So they're kind of like a little Roomba. If anyone has those little Roombas that go around your house and they like, they yes. just move on their own and they just go around the floor. Kind of what I have in my mind is like on the body of a whale or dolphin is this little remora moving along. That is a good analogy. We just got a like a Roomba and that it is. We would see them and they'd move around and it's really cool because they'd unsuck and then they'd swim and they'd suck again. And they'd right. like, hitch, hitch around. Hitch up, right. <laughs> yeah. And then one went over by his mouth and you could see him. He's like, stop it, stop it. <laughs> right. It's like, like off. <laughs> off. <laughs> Um, so again, kind of like the whale lice, um, remoras do also seem to have kind of favorite locations on the whale or the dolphin. So typically, it seems like this is most likely to where they would have access to the most food or that might be the safest place to hang on in terms of being in the water column. So for example, they'll often be found around the blowhole or around the dorsal fin. So the blowhole is likely where they might get more food. And if you hang out behind the dorsal fin, all the water is going to hit the front of the dorsal fin and you're in that nice little shadow behind it. So there's less likelihood of them getting um, pulled off by just water pressure, basically moving past them. Yeah. Um, and again, so this kind of comes back full circle because they will also, like I said, eating parasites. So they will also eat, for example, some of the whale lice that are on the whale. So it's again, it kind of circles back to sort of discussing about the sea otters and stuff. There is like I said, kind of a whole ecosystem that happens on the body of these whales or dolphins where it's all circular and they all kind of feed into one another, sometimes literally. <laughs> Didn't even mean to do that. Uh -oh. Um, oh yeah. But yeah, so I mean, it's, it's crazy. And then also the remoras will also obviously be getting protection by hanging on to a larger animal um, and providing in some ways a service to that animal by keeping their parasite load at a manageable level. <laughs> So, yeah, remoras are, are like relationships. they are very really cool. Um, and so sometimes we see free swimming remoras in in the Bahamas. So I've those are yeah, it, they're they look really weird because you can see their whole top of their head and they're just like this weird upside down fish. Um, but we found out that they actually have like teeth, like that can bite you. Oh. Yeah, we had a graduate student that was in the water, and so the, the remoras will come up and be like, oh, what are you? And then you can see people right, freaking not out. Because you. <laughs> right, you don't want that to happen. But the good thing is, really, if you get one, if one happens to attach to you, if you come up to the surface and get out of the water, it will eventually come off because it can't breathe outside the water. But in the moment, it's a little bit freaky as this remora is trying to come <laughs> and suck on you. So um, it was swimming around, and it bit her finger, and she came up, and it was bleeding. And we're like, wow, I didn't. I didn't know that remoras could do that. You always just think that they got their little suction cup and that's it. Right. So, you know, just beware of, of remoras. Right. They might... They're not cute and cuddly kids. Right. And we would see them a lot of times on the, on the sharks as well. And usually sharks yeah. would have a bunch of, like quite a few. Sharks and they would, like you said, they would be different species than the one we see mm -hmm. on the, um, on the dolphins. Yeah. And so that's the thing. I think most people know remoras from like, I, I, for example, have seen them a lot on nature documentaries and they're discussing their relationship with sharks typically. Right. Um, Cause they're, you know, obviously talking about how like, Ooh, this big and scary shark species. And yet here's this little fish that gets a free pass. Like, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like I said, I mean, a commensalist relationship, they're not harming the shark. They're getting food out of the deal. And like I said, mm -hmm. they're also then helping to basically exfoliate mm -hmm. and reduce parasite loads and, you know, other services that marine mammals may not otherwise get. So really <laughs> the remoras no, are, are a handy, handy species. They're like a little mobile spa. There you go. Exactly. Maybe it even feels like a little massage. Who knows? Oh, there you go. Well, yeah, you never know. Oh, that's gross to think about. Never mind. <laughs> so with that, <laughs> we got sea lice on, on your skin and then this massaging fish. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 
weird. But that's what's awesome about it. I love it. Um, all right, so that's uh, our episode on other ways that rain mammals uh, can help other species. Um, and so next week we'll be back. I think we'll have another, uh, oh, an exciting paper review um, mm -hmm. about- Stay tuned, behavior. this is gonna be a yes, good one. A new behavior from orcas up here. So that'll be exciting. So um, that's it for us and uh, we will see you next time. Bye. Bye. This was brought to you by Pacific Mammal Research, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. To learn more about the species we discuss, check out our blog. Head to our website, www.pacmam.org, that's P-A-C-M-A-M.org, to check it out. Also, help us continue providing fun and educational content like this by donating today. Your help is how we can continue to do our work and share it with you. Thanks.